Prior to the conference, or the workshop starting and at the conclusion, uh, the workshop will be about 60 minutes long. There'll be one CEU offered for our workshop this afternoon, and with a total of four CEU offerings, as you've probably already discovered throughout the day today. Uh, these CEUs are for LPCs, LMFTs, social workers, and psychologists. Uh, the post-session survey that you'll get on your QR code, you do need to complete to get your CEUs. And the certificate will be sent directly to you once that's completed. So um, if you have any questions, please see someone out at the table or see one of us. Uh, it's our pleasure at this time to introduce our conversation for this afternoon. Building healthy families with intention is an area that society has identified as a factor in recent increases in trauma and breaking the cycle of trauma across families. Today our panelists will describe to you the psychological perspective of current day families and the services available within our community to support the needs of our families as we prepare for the future. The changes and challenges that come from raising children Having a family in this day and time are clouded by social isolation, isolation and increased access to social media, just in part. The offering of resources to create and strengthen the parent-child bond, fostering positive childhood experiences and flourishing families will reduce the impact of this isolation and trauma, thus breaking the cycle of abuse and trauma across our community. Our first speaker on the panel today is a retired Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Frank Emmett. He serves as the clinical director at the Ecumenical Center. Dr. Emmett specializes in marital and family counseling, parenting effectiveness, personality disorders, men's issues as well. He's assisted many clients at the Ecumenical Center through mental wellness, growth, and healing. Dr. Emmett also oversees the testing program which he conducts psychological assessments for individuals, parents, and for corporate leaders. He is trained in the uh, skill of EMDR in working with our trauma victims and very strong influence uh, with his military service in caring for our active duty military veterans and their families. Our second speaker today is Ms. Mary Gar. Mary is a retired colonel she also serves as the president and CEO of Family Service. She's an experienced leader with three decades of diverse roles in several industries, including healthcare, city management, the military, both as a CEO and a COO. As CEO of Family Service, Mary is responsible for the day-to-day -day management and operations of Family Service and leading her teams collaboratively to work to improve health of our community by addressing challenges and the adversity in people's lives. Mary holds a bachelor's degree in foreign service from Georgetown University, a master's degree in health administration from Baylor University, and strategic studies in the U.S. Army War College. She has been actively engaged in the San Antonio community for a number of years, both in her military service and in her volunteer service, beyond her acting as the CEO of Family Service by serving on nonprofit and various boards and committees across our community. Uh, she has been at Family Service since 2018. Yay, let's give them a hand. And our third speaker for today, for our conversation, is Jessica Weaver. Jessica is the CEO, Executive Director, for Communities and Schools of San Antonio. She's been with Communities and Schools, drum roll please, for over 35 years. She became the CEO of Communities and Schools in 2014. Um, she started there in 1989 as a site coordinator. I learned all this just recently, Jessica. Um, followed by a field manager, then director of programs, then the chief operating officer, and finally, the role that she holds today as the chief executive officer. She's a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin. I heard that. So without further ado, I'd like to, we'd like to begin with our first speaker, Dr. Frank Emmett. Thank you, Mary Beth. 
And thank you all for being here today. And thank you for your service, not only perhaps in the military, but in the daily life of this community. Um, there are a lot of issues that impact us daily in terms of our families, our children, our neighborhoods, and things that we want to be better. There are a number of trends that we see at the Ecumenical Center. Um, we have a cadre of clinicians, licensed professional counselors, social workers, clinical psychologists, and other paraprofessionals that assist us in dealing with our population, which is throughout the San Antonio uh, area, up to Johnson City, down to Lavernia, down to Corpus Christi. Um, and I have the pleasure and challenge of directing and overseeing these great group of individuals. What they're telling me as the clinical director is that times have changed. I've been in mental health and as a psychologist for over 50 years, and things do change. It's a dynamic that is part of what we hope to bring to a positive and successful degree of ability to help individuals. One of the things we are seeing more of now, and I think it's very, very critical, is anxiety slash fear, which is having a deleterious effect Oops. on our society, our ability to relate to one another, and to have a sense of purpose and security within our homes, family, and network. Another problem that is occurring within our school system, I'm hearing from our counselors and psychotherapists, is defiance. Defiance that comes from an unknown place, apparently, that imperils the learning ability of not only the individual who is acting out, but also disturbing the individuals who are trying to learn and trying to be helpful to others. That seems to be a trend that we would really like to see change. Another issue are the number of people between the ages of 8 and 18 who have either thought about suicide, considered and planned for suicide, and only been interrupted at the last moment for many of them. Where is that coming from? Where is that despair? that sense of vulnerability that imperils the, not only the youth, but the family and the community in terms of what has been lost to, by the individual who ends his or her life at such a young age because of the despair the depression, the fear that they are experiencing. How do we, as a mental health community, find, touch, treat, and repair these youth? That's one of the challenges we have and our team has on a daily basis, as do many of yours, I'm sure. Substance abuse, which we just had a very nice presentation on preceding this, but the, not only is it vaping, not only is it street drugs, 
and our old friend alcohol seem to be an increasing issue as was addressed and one that we need to be mindful of even if we are not necessarily trying to reach out and touch that specific individual but rather it's a broad-based awareness that we all go into our offices with and are looking for in terms of what is troubling this youth, this young adult, this 20-year-old that brings them to such a low level of optimism and hope for the future. We are also seeing, according to my, some of my clinicians, a very interesting phenomenon that has been going on gradually for the last few years. And that is, our kids are growing up very, very, very quickly. As many of you know, many of you who have children are aware of, they're learning things at six years old and 12 years old that most of us didn't learn until we were 17, 18, 19. We can talk about media, we can talk about screens, we can talk about a number of different things. But there is an impact that is having a, a negative effect, some would say, um, some would feel, um, that comes directly from that. And sexual curiosity and experimentation starting about the fifth or the sixth grade is not unusual, according to my clinicians. It happens. They see it. They hear it. It's feedback. Another trend, since we are an ecumenical center, we have a spiritual base that is non-denominational or multidimensional, however you would like to phrase it. But one of the things we are aware of is the decline in individuals and families in particular who are no longer attending services of any sort for the growth of the spirit and the bonding with others who believe are optimistic, who are nurturing to one another. The statistics on that are fairly clear. This seems to have led further to increased divorce and cohabitation becoming acceptable. Divorce and cohabitation result typically and the statistics show it, that there are later marriages and fewer children. Fewer children lead us to less organized religious membership and attendance. Less organized religious meetings and meetings combined with more children of divorce means fewer marriages. That is a trend. And unfortunately, the result on the child can be having a worse education, a more harsh life, and health outcomes. This imposes a cost on all of us. It's worse for the single parent, too, as, long as they are 1.3 times more likely to develop a heart condition than those who are partnered parents. There is a difference between cohabitation and marriage. The difference is, in 
cohabitation, one of the members of the dyad can simply get up and walk away and there's nothing there left. There's no sense of joining. There's no sense of pledging one's love, affection, and security to another and having that upheld. It is devastating for many of the individuals I see post-divorce. And it's not, it's both men and women who are being left. They are not connected, they are not committed. They, one may think, but they're just is not holding up. We know that approximately 25% of marriages end, end in divorce or a breakup. And nearly three quarters of second marriages, three quarters, end in divorce as well. So divorce is a major issue in terms of trying to re-solidify the unit that is the family. Those are some trends we've been picking up from our clinicians, listening to others, and I hope that gives you some insights into what we're facing because it's not as compact, it's not as, it's not the same as it used to be 10 years ago, much less 20 years ago, or 30 years ago. And I challenge anyone to say it's better now than it was then, in many respects. I think that's the challenge for all of us to answer. Can we make it good again? For, for not only children, but their parents, their grandparents, and the support systems that affirm us all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Emmett, for kind of laying the platform for our conversation today to talk about what some of the uh, criteria are that we may see differently today than perhaps in the past. And uh, with that, we'll move to our next speaker, Mary Garr, who's going to share with us um, some theory behind social determinants of health and services that the Family Service Association of San Antonio provides. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. And especially on a Friday afternoon on a very warm day and we know it's past lunch and y'all have a busy day tomorrow and glad to have y'all here. So um, appreciate the opportunity to talk about families who are really such a foundational basis of our communities and all that needs to, to be there to support them so they can be happy, healthy, and successful. So I'm going to just go through a little bit as Mary Beth said. First, I want to give some context. You know, our mission at Family Service, by the way, we are almost 122 years old. We've been around since 1903, really working to address those deep-rooted um, challenges challenges in the lives of the families across the communities that we serve. How we do it is by addressing, understanding and addressing those social determinants of health barriers and being trauma-informed in our work. I'll talk briefly about that. So first off, understanding health right up front. You know, when we think about health, we tend to immediately jump to like physical and mental health, right? But there's so many more aspects to what is health and what's involved in that, that all comes into what do we do when we're working with individuals, families, communities, or even yourselves in your own life in terms of what is health. So normally I go through and have y'all guess, but in the interest of time, I'm just gonna run through some of these. No, it's not all inclusive. So for instance, Emotional health, right? Social health. Financial health, absolutely important and a huge stressor for so many families. Environmental health, occupational health, spiritual health, obviously many others. This isn't all inclusive. Y'all can think of a few on your own. But then understanding also, it's the health of individuals, families, and communities. They all intertwine. The health at one level absolutely affects the health of another. If you're working with an individual, you know that the whole family's affected. If you're working with a family, it affects the individuals. If they're in a community that is struggling, the families tend to be struggling more and vice versa. So in that, Understanding what are true influences of health. 
Health happens where we spend our time. And I'm a healthcare administrator by background, as you heard Mary Beth say. So I've worked in many hospitals and clinics and health systems over the years. By the time patients get to the hospitals or clinics, unless it's preventive care, those you know annual wellness things, which a lot don't get, they're sick. They're already dealing with the effects of what's been happening in their lives. So what can we do up front when the average person in the United States only has an opportunity to see a healthcare provider about 100 minutes a year? That's about four patient appointments. And even the best doctors and nurses will tell you, if they're only spending about 100 minutes a year seeing a patient, how much influence do they really have on their health? They don't. Health happens where we spend our time. That's at home, that's at work, that's at school, after school for our kids. So where are people? You know, what are our families doing at home to help health? Do they have health literacy and nutritional literacy to know how to take care of themselves and their children? Do their employers do a good job taking care of the employees at work? Are our schools equipped to be able to address health needs? And we know that teachers and schools are doing so much more than just teaching in the classroom. For many, they are filling in gaps that families just aren't equipped to do, filling in gaps that our communities aren't able to address. They're doing a lot more than just teaching in the classroom because they have to. And do they understand their roles in that? And then, for, again, for kids, what are they doing after school? Do they have parents who are home after school? Do they have safe places to be after school? Do they have parents who are working two and three shifts and they're hoping their kids are home and safe and who knows where they're at if they're not? Or you know, what are they doing? Because that's influencing their health as well. So that's what we've got to think about and also other big influences of health. Each of you and your work, you are influencing health at its core and not just emotional or mental health here and physical health, but all those other aspects of too, also too, you can be influencing. And then thinking about, and I always throw out who doesn't love our own HEBs, right? Our grocery stores influence health. If you have a chance to get to your grocery store, do you have transportation to get there? Do you have the finances to buy the food there? Do you have enough nutritional literacy to know and feel that you can afford to buy healthy fruits and vegetables and proteins, etc.? Or are you going to the Dollar General store because you do have transportation to get there and it's cheap, cheap food, right? You can buy a lot to fill your kids' tummies, but you know, mac and cheese and hamburger helper, with or without the hamburger, you know, a lot of high processed chemical, sodium food, etc., doesn't mean your kid is going to have nutritious food, although they won't be hungry for the moment here. So we've got to think about that. Outdoor living spaces and places, places to be active. And of course, we knew, especially during the pandemic, how important it was to have a chance to be outdoors and the effect that being outdoors isn't just on physical health, but mental and emotional health too. But if you don't live in a neighborhood where you feel safe, where you've got sidewalks or street lights or you know no stray dogs and you know your neighbors, you know if you feel comfortable, that's great. Do you have a park nearby or a greenway trail? We have beautiful ones here. Then that's wonderful. But a lot of our neighborhoods don't have have that and so therefore they don't feel safe going out they don't want their kids going out they don't know their neighbors and if something bad happens at home who would they reach out to if they don't feel that they can reach out to their neighbors who should be part of their support network but that's an influencer um, our faith-based orgs whether it's churches temples synagogues etc generally tend to be trusted agents, right? They influence not just spiritual health, but they can impact other aspects of health as well because people listen to them. They trust them. And much as we didn't want to see healthcare politicized, we know it was during the pandemic. It still continues to be. So understanding the impact and how to work with faith-based organizations to help in health as well. And then community-based organizations that whether they realize it or not, they're influencing health every day and they are trusted agents as well supporting um, the clients that they serve all big influencers and so many more so we've got to understand where health is happening because all of that ties to helping to support strengthening families and building strong healthy families and communities so with that again health spectrum understand what is health up front as I talked about know what is included in, in health um, health happens, as I said, where we spend our time. 
We at Family Service, we follow, and I'll talk, show that in another slide in a moment, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services Healthy People Initiative. It's been a program around since 1979. They bring together health and healthcare experts every couple of years from around the country to talk about what can they do, what can we all collectively do as a nation to improve the health and well-being of all people here in our country. And they update standards every 10 years on where they think that local communities could look at and then bring that back down, scale it down to their communities to improve health and well-being of all people, and that includes families. That's the model that we have at Family Service. That's what we talk about in our communities because that's something you can pull from as well. Currently, they have over 350 indicators, all tied to some aspect of health that can support the families that you serve. And then understanding, too, what does social determinants of health involve? It starts before we're born, and it carries on through every phase of life, and it affects not just one generation, but it's multi-generations, and it's intergenerational, and the health that affects one of us affects all of us collectively here. So in that, what are social determinants of health? You might have heard this phrase, and it's thrown out a lot. People tend to get you know, stuck on one or two pieces of it. But in this framework, you can understand that there are five pillars or domains. Economic stability, education, access to high quality, um, access to high quality health and health care, neighborhood and built environment, and, and uh, social and community context or support. I want to give you some examples of that. So think about in context of having healthy families. You know, economic stability, are you living in poverty? Do you have strong access to workforce development that it will enable you to have good jobs with pay and benefits to take care of you and your family? Do you have food on your table, not just for today, but every day? Do you have affordable housing? Are you concerned about being evicted at any time which you know the stress and trauma that that puts on you and on the entire family? Under education, again, that starts out early childhood education, not just child care. We want high quality child care, but you really want affordable early childhood education and development, which is a foundational element in a child's life success. And then carry on to strong education supports for elementary, middle, and high school, making sure kids have the supports to be able to not just stay in school, but thrive in school, graduate from school, and then be ready for college or career readiness afterwards. And then adult learning that is going to go on, as we know, throughout all of our lives here. Under that health and health care, it's primary care, having access to primary physical care, but also the mental care, which we know has always been in such a shortage, not just since the pandemic, but it was a shortage, as we all know, beforehand as well. And then having that health um, literacy, nutritional literacy, etc., um, et that I mentioned before. Under the neighborhood and built environment, are you living in a safe home? Are you in a home that has lead pipes that are contaminating your water? You know, do you live in a home that has lead paint and asbestos or roach or rodent control that can affect your um, respiratory system? Kids who are growing up in poverty and in um, homes that are not well maintained or apartments are higher risk for respiratory problems like asthma and other things as well. And then from there, are you in a safe neighborhood? Do you have the infrastructure and access to support? As I mentioned, like, you know, safe side, you know, sidewalks and lighting and um, streets, but even beyond, or do you have a grocery store in your neighborhood? Do you have a bank in your neighborhood? Do you have public transportation to get to work and school if you can't afford your own car out there? And then are you living, you know, near um, outdoor living spaces, but are you living next to a factory that puts smog in the air, that leaches toxins into the earth or into your water. We know that our affluent neighborhoods are not where those factories have been built over the years, right? You know, when all the highways were put into our country years ago, they weren't being put right through our affluent neighborhoods. They were fracturing poor income neighborhoods, primarily neighborhoods of color, which relied on those neighborhoods for those supports. Because one of the biggest supports for families uh, in poverty is the strength of that neighborhood and that social cohesion, which ties to social community and community context or support. And when you don't have that, that can lead to a cascade of other issues as well, because you are isolated and alone, or you believe that you are. But in that context, you know, dealing with the effects of discrimination, dealing 
the effects of incarceration and second chance, but not knowing how to access resources when and where you need them. And then just as importantly, not, you know, are you feeling isolated and alone? That social engagement is so important to your sense of purpose and value and feeling that somebody cares about you and that you have a reason to be here. All of that ties into social determinants of health. And so when you put that into context, you know, what is it that when you're looking at a healthy family, and there's a lot of things you can think about, but here are a few that I, I have listed for you. So one is, is that a nurturing family unit? Do they understand what it means to nurture and take care of each other here? Being supportive. Positive communication. Not no communication, not conflict communication, but positive communication. Being resilient, you can have bad things happen, but do you have the strengths and the skills to be resilient and overcome You know when something bad is going on in your lives here? Having positive attitudes and shared values and beliefs out there. You know, and as you know, in so many of our populations in the history of our country, where children have been forcibly taken away and put into boarding schools, where language and culture have been taken away and, and lost in there, or forced displacement and all these other things that have gone on over centuries, that still that past impacts where we're at today with families. And then the ability to handle conflict and not have excessive conflict. Conflict isn't bad. It happens to all of us. So you don't want to have no conflict. That's a problem. But being able to address conflict in a constructive way and move beyond it. And then really, do you like to spend time together? Families that like to spend time together are also healthier. So from there, signs of a dysfunctional family. And it's not the opposite, but the, you know, these are things to think about. You know, obviously extremes and conflict, like I said, it's disproportionate response to something that's going on where you have high conflict or the opposite where you don't work through an issue and it just simmers, you know, like something bad going on in the room, but nobody wants to talk about it or is allowed to talk about it. Child abuse and neglect, obviously there. Poor communication or nor no communication. And then that lack of resiliency with those family dynamics, you know, what we traditionally talk about with ACEs with, um, you know, dysfunctional family issues going on. It could be family loss, substance abuse, you know, other family stressors, etc. Having an over-controlling parent, and that could be over-controlling with the children, but it also could be over-controlling with the spouse or that other adult partner, too. All of that negatively impacts the child. And then having that lack of support or empathy for what's going on in that child's life or even in the whole family um, dynamic at that time. And then they don't spend time together. They really don't work to build that relationship. And poor boundaries, another key issue there, as well as that social isolation. You know, when there is something going on, especially with the control piece, if the whole family's isolated, then they don't have the ability to be able to access those supports and resources to help them address their, their needs and concerns. And um, so with that, you know, talking now about what are some of the tools and resources to help strengthen our families. So first off, you know, it's understanding that Creating and helping families to be healthier, it's not a problem to be fixed or solved. And we also need to look at it not really just from a needs base, but really more of a strengths base. You know, what is going well within that family unit? And then how do we build from there? So as we all know, none of us can do this alone. And especially with families. You know, when we talk about family, that means more than one person. And it oftentimes means more, it's more than outside that nuclear family unit, which can mean so many different different things. It really does take a um, village to raise a child. So there's the family component, there's the friend component, there's the neighborhood component, there's the schools component. You'll hear more from Jessica about that in a moment. And then the whole community component as well that is involved in that here. So when you're you know, looking at these, these are some of the programs that we specifically have at Family Service. Some of you might have these in your own organizations, but you can also, if you have them there, that's one thing. If you know how to refer to any of us that are providing these services, Family Service is one of the orgs that, that does, um, you know, provide support in these different areas here. So I'm going to talk through each one very briefly. First one is on couples programs. When you're thinking about couples programs, 
First off, it can be hard for couples to seek help, right? You know, they oftentimes don't want to admit there's a problem or, you know, they don't want to talk with each other about it. But as you know, that's going to affect the whole family dynamic here. But then beyond that, for many families, you know, couples counseling can be unaffordable. It's not always available, especially for our low-income families who already have the additional stressors tied to SDOH barriers such as financial challenges, etc., that can impact those relationships and thus the health of the families. And then as we know here in San Antonio, finding bilingual counseling for any sort can be hard to find. Bilingual counseling for couples is very hard to find as well. So on that, when we're looking at couples programs, as you know, when we look at couples relationships, that impacts the children and the whole family unit. Whether couples think they're hiding it or not, it's affecting the whole family. And then from there, couples who are in stress or conflict, you know, that leads to whole families in stress or conflict very often. And then, you know, much as we want to think we can keep things hidden from our kids, just like at Christmas time when you're hiding Priscilla's presence, you know, if they can find out, they will. Kids are very observant. They're intuitive. They see what's going on. If there's tension, they're going to absorb it as well. And it's either going to be hidden and internalized with them, or it's going to manifest in some other way that, again, that affects the whole family, even when those parents don't want to discuss those issues. Managing couples, their own relationships, can help improve the entire family relationship. And then, as you know, couples' programs that strengthen their relationships, again, strengthen the family relationships. So on family strengthening, you know, when we're thinking about how do you strengthen a family or help a family to strengthen, some of the things that we have in our own programs, you know, one, you know, improving relationships improving that communication, that cohesion, the nurturing, respect, helps to improve children's success in school and in life. The research is clearly there on that. Working on family strengthening also improves that parent-child bond and relationship and also helps that parent to understand their role as a parent as the head of the household unit. Sometimes parents, we talked about boundaries, don't always understand their role in being a parent. They might want to be, you know, a buddy or a friend or, you know, or distance themselves. They don't always understand that role. And conversely, the child can start to get mixed signals in understanding, well, what is a parent and what isn't, isn't a parent? And what do I have boundaries or how can I push those boundaries if they don't understand what that means? So having that clear um, family structure and whose role is what is really important in strengthening families. Also, you know, again, as I said, helping parents to understand their roles, helping to understand what family units are, and helping them to understand that parents truly are their child's first educator, their first advocate, their first nurturer and support at home, but also support in school, and knowing that they've got to be physically present in their child's life in a positive way. Not just physically present, but in a positive way for that child. And then, you know, also the importance when you're working on family strengthening programs, a lot of families, they feel like they're the only ones struggling. And that's embarrassing for them. That's hard for them to admit. So helping them to understand they're not the only parents who are struggling. They're not the only families who are struggling. There's no blueprint for us, right? And not all of us have had strong parents to help us at home growing up ourselves or strong family units to help us. So we're just trying to do the best we can with what we have, right? But sometimes it's not enough. So having that your support really does help that child's success as well. And frankly, it can help build that social capital for the parents and the family also when they are out there engaged with their children, out engaged in the neighborhood and the community and the schools too. The kids can see their parents doing well and that gives that social capital and understanding. And then also it helps children, uh, parents feel more comfortable engaging with their children's schools. Think about it. You know, we have a lot of parents, they didn't graduate from high school. They had a bad experience in high school, even if they did graduate. Or they've come from another country. We've had clients that they finished school at age eight because they had to get out there and work. So they don't understand the school system. School systems are intimidating. They can you know, be scary, and if you had a, a bad experience, you don't wanna put yourself out there. So how can you advocate for your child when you don't trust that system yourself? 
You've got to find ways to work, and these programs can help families do that and, and build that real relationship, not just with the child and the family unit, but also in partnering with the school and supporting that child's success. And then helping parents connect to community resources and for that family to feel included within a community. Again, it's making sure they don't feel and aren't physically isolated and alienated from the outside that they are engaged in the school because schools are huge community resources and connectors but within the broader neighborhood within the broader communities you know to be out there so the children can see their role in the as future adults to be engaged in their communities and be leaders in their communities when they see their parents doing the same and when I say parent, it could be any caregiver. We have grandparents raising grandkids. We have great grandparents raising great grandkids because there's no parent or grandparent left. And that tells you something too about the family dynamic. But we also have, you know, foster parents and, and other kinship parents and then adoptive parents, etc. Um, ultimately, all of these supports, they help to improve that family health and well-being and help to establish that first future success here. So we want to ensure that interactive engagement. You know, when we, if you grew up in a more like traditional kind of family, you know, people who have, they don't realize that there's a lot of families, they didn't grow up and understand the importance of having dinner regularly with your children, having conversations at the dinner table, table with your children, listening to them about what's going on in school or home and their lives, going out on activities, you know, bonding with them. They don't have that, that relationship here, and so therefore that support piece is lacking. You know, teens, the research has shown that teens whose families regularly eat dinner together are less likely than to engage in promiscuous hate, um, behaviors, use alcohol or drugs that could affect their outcomes later on. It's all about that sense of engagement, knowing your children here. Um, and then that also, you know, helps to reduce family conflict, build that confidence and esteem for the child and the parents, helps that family structure, which we know that when kids have structure within family, that also helps to reduce strength, um, stress and anxiety. Kids need that structure. They don't always want to admit it, but they do need that structure here. And then understanding about the importance of you know sharing feelings when that can be really hard, especially when issues arise or if something bad is happening. If a parent has gotten sick or has a terminal illness or if a parent's lost a job, you know, or you know something else is going on, that tension's going to be felt in the family, even if it's not spoken of. So helping in age-appropriate ways for children to understand and understand that it will be okay but being able to be strong enough as a family to open up and work with it that all um, helps to manage that stress and then build that strength so another program positive parenting program or triple p also here in san antonio we're, we're part of that as well so there's different pieces to that this one is a specific multi-system level of supports that works to prevent treat you know and i list here social emotional behavioral problems in children uh, and there it works on, again, helping the parents and building up their knowledge, their skills, their confidence. Similar but different than what we have with our family strengthening programs. And in there, it, it really works to combine that social learning theory with a public health pr approach because that is considered a gold standard for promoting childhood well-being. There are different levels of intervention tied to um, to the triple P, there's a low intensity all the way up to high intensity. And then there's a range of programs tied to it. There's programs tied for, for um, new parents, for little ones. There's um, programs tied for te to teens, parents with children of disabilities, specifically children who are obese. Programs for those who have children dealing with stress and anxiety, um, for indigenous populations, and let's see if I have any others here that are listed. There's a few others out there as well. Parents who have gone through divorce or separation and then a couple of others. But all of that works in the triple P space here. And again, the key thing is it's a parenting and family support system to help give some of that guidance and support to better equip parents um, with those, those skills and that confidence to handle those family issues when they arise so they don't now then adversely impact the children and the family unit. And it works to engage children, parents, and a specific emphasis on fathers because we know how important the role of a father is in a child's life, even if they're not present for various reasons, but to bring them in to engage and be part of it as best as possible. 
Dual Gen Approach is another um, program out there, and, and they say dual gen, but again, we emphasize it's not just like parent children. We know many families, especially here in Texas, have multiple generations. So it's the children, it's the parents, it's the great grandparents, it could be the aunt, you know, it could be the great grand, you know, parent as well. There's a lot of different um, generations involved with that, but that works with the entire family, the parents or whoever the caregivers are, and the children, and there's children components, adult components, and then they combine as well to, um, for both. And again, as you see, similar themes about parent strengthening, uh, family roles, focus on financial health, again, because they know those financial stressors that impact then the whole family health dynamic in a lot of different ways, uh, workforce development opportunities. This program, uh, through the Ascend Network, actually has six different components. I list these out here. And the focus isn't on just helping families to get through the day or survive, but really to thrive and be set up for success as, as a family. Outcomes of all of these programs, they're all very similar. Again, what can we address and mitigate what is going on today in your life as a family? From there, what can we do to build resiliency and coping strategies with you? With you, this is your life journey as a family unit. Again, helping to instill healthy family behaviors using that broad definition of health I spoke about at the beginning and ultimately creating stronger, healthier families because that then ties into us in the broader scheme of things. That top path, that is a child that is struggling that doesn't have supports within that family unit and falls through the cracks at school and the community. So you can see, actually the bottom one is, the top one is the one that gets that support and that family gets that support, whatever, whether it's a single mom raising a child or both parents and multiple generations. But that child gets that support right up front early in life, carries on through school, goes on to strong life success as an adult, strong relationships healthy families, him or herself, and you know, good end of life there, breaking the cycles of whatever they might have been born into. That child on the bottom, maybe same circumstances they were born into, but didn't have those supports, struggled at home, really, you know, a tough home environment, fell through the cracks or things went on in school, maybe didn't finish school, wasn't set up for college or career, then who knows what went on in those lives and if they're alive at 40 or 50, what were their outcomes? Were they in jail? Were they disabled? Are they, you know, struggling with mental health and substance abuse issues, etc.? And did now that same thing happen with whatever kids they might have had along the way because they didn't have those supports? Because then at the end, how do we see our future? When we have strong individuals and healthy individuals and strong, healthy families, we can create stronger, healthier communities and neighborhoods. When we have lack of support within neighborhoods and communities, toxic communities out there, we've seen that in many throughout our country, then that hurts the family. It's harder for them to struggle to overcome and move beyond that. And then those cycles continue. So that's where I'm at right now. I'm going to turn it over to Jessica. Yes, please. Thank you, Mary. Oh, it has to start over now? No, no, no. All right. Well, I'm going to let Mary start that. And um, I'm going to introduce myself because I really want to talk about more from our individual. Um, when you walk out of here, I know that each of you can be a part of um, strengthening our youth and strengthening our families. Um, as you've heard, our families look different today. Um, so I'm Jessica Weaver. You heard all the professional part of me. But um, I grew up in a single family home. Uh, my mom raised me. Um, she did not finish high school. Um, she grew up in a time where she wasn't allowed to speak Spanish in school. And um, it wasn't a place of, you know, that felt safe for her. Um, but she was my biggest cheerleader when it came to school. So it didn't get in the way of that, but it wasn't the person that I could go to to help me figure out more things in life, right? Around school, around education. I did graduate from high school, first in my family. I did go to uh, the University of Texas at Austin, so first in my family. Um, but it didn't, it wasn't just because of my immediate family, it was really about a whole community. It was about a whole community that surrounded me and be able to um, really support the efforts. 
So I say all that because there are many factors and influences. Oh, where did we go? <laughs> it, the whole thing, when, when I turned mine over here, somehow they exited me. Well, I'll keep going. <laughs> and if there's somebody that works here that wants to help on this, because it's I can't get it to link back up again, so. So um, I make that connection because our community uh, for our kids are really surrounded by a lot of different influences. Um, and so with communities and schools, our mission is to surround students with a community of support, empowering them to stay in school and achieve in life. So you can see where the community part of our mission comes in. And so I've had the privilege, you heard 35 years, I've just had the privilege to be able to work in a mission that was very much personally a fit for me because I knew what a community of support did for my life and that was what I wanted to bring to our kids. We work in all schools that are Title I schools. What, what that means is um, low socioeconomic. So we already know all most of our kids have... Um, are under-resourced um, and have different challenges that they already bring to the table. Our schools, thank you, Mary. We're having dinner afterwards too, so <laughs> I'll, I'll treat her. <laughs> um, and so we know that our schools, um, are op their doors are open to all factors, right? Their doors aren't about only if you have this or this. Our, their doors are open to all students, all families, thank you. Um, and so knowing that, we know that bringing a community support, and what a community of support means is it could mean some of our um, nonprofit partners, it could mean um, individuals around them, but where do our kids spend a lot of their time? They're, they spend a ton of time in school. So the influence that we have is bringing our site coordinators full time into a campus that they work there full time. And so it's not just the influence of our kids, but it's also influencing the system of schools and the adults that are on there. And that's what I want to talk about. So relationships are all what we believe in. It is the framework of what we do. Um, relationships are essential, but they're more than just caring. Relationships are also intentional. You can build intentionality on the relationships to really build um, the capacity of our kids and for their future. And that's what I want all of you to think about right now. Think about a relationship that you all had or relationships. It can be your family. It can be some significant people in your life that really, really helped you develop as an individual. And maybe you didn't recognize that until you were late, later in life but there are relationships that mean. But it was more than that just somebody cared. They were very intentional in that work. So the circles of influence, uh, Mary talked about this, right? There are so many aspects of our life. Um, and we, um, for communities and schools, have a big focus on schools, but we also have staff at Haven for Hope. We also have staff, but the end result is we're really trying to support our youth in being successful in school so that they could be their best um, in the future. And so we know that there are many circles of influence in our kids' life, and you are all some of those. Um, and I want you to think about how you influence that and how you're in that circle of, of influence. So developmental relationships could actually have its own session, so I'm not going to try to go. I'm going to introduce you to developmental relationships. It is kind of natural to what we think we should be doing, but it actually has a framework, and it's um, a research based from Search Institute. And so it really does have, um, has shown the impact. And so development relationships are close connections through which young people discover who they are, not what we tell them they should be, or not what we think they should be, it's discover who they are. They gain abilities to shape their own lives and learn how to interact with and contribute to the world around them. I mean, I don't know anybody who disagrees with that, right? Um, but it's about building that. So developmental relationships is actually a framework and it has five elements. It provides support, expand possibilities, share power, challenge growth, and express care. So if you ever want to look up around Search Institute, Search Institute is really, it's, an, um, it's a nonprofit organization and it bridges the research to practice. So it's the things that we believe are right, but how do we know they make a difference? And they're, they've done a ton of research, gotten youth voice, gotten um, uh, been able to research and follow kids to be able to see the impact that they make. And so these five elements are the framework of developmental relationships. And so I'm gonna go through them really quick. 
Um, but I think once you, when, I, when you read through them, because they're really common words, it is not like um, diagnostic words, it's not intervention words, there are things that we all want in our life. Um, one of them is express care. Um, it's about being dependable, it's about listening, it's about believing in me, um, being warm and encouraging. That's what kids want to see. And I want you to think about all the systems that our kids are in. They're in school systems. They go to, um, we talk about, right, bedside manner of our doctors, right? We talk about that. Well, how about bedside manner of, um, as a parent, when you're really hungry and you're, and you're tired and you're trying to have a developmental relationship with your child? It's probably not the best. You're not at your best. But thinking about all those influences our kids have, but they really want to see um, that you express their care in those ways. The next one is challenge growth. Um, so just to tell you, I have a 30-something year old. I think I always lose count how, how much 30 is because then I have to really think about how old I am. Um, and then I have a 21-year-old and then I have an 18-year-old. And so I have learned lots of lessons of where I've done well in some of these and where I could have probably done better and where I can continue to improve. Um, I was a single parent for a little while. Um, I'm, we're in a blended family. I've been married now for 20 something years. So I've had all the aspects of how life just changes, right? But these things don't have to change and around the relationship that you can have. But also seeking those people who can have those relationships with the youth around us. Because a parent can't be everything and everything because we're not everywhere. And so being consistent with um, asking for those things for your child are important as well. So challenge growth is um, the things that we expect, right? Um, expect my best, stretch me. Kids really do want to be stretched. They really want to be challenged. They really want to be able to grow. They might be afraid, but it's okay. And more than anything is reflect on failures. We are all going to fail. Um, not punish failures, but reflect on failures. How can I learn from them? The next one is provide support. So remember I talked about these are really easy, common words that we hear every day, but provide support means something. It, mean, it means that you navigate, you empower, you advocate, and you set boundaries. It doesn't mean that you do it for them every time. It means that you really help them navigate their pathways for what their next goal is. And sometimes the things that they're interested in may not be what you think they should be interested in. Obviously, if the set boundaries is important, right? But sometimes you really have to think about navigating things that maybe aren't of your interest, or somebody else may help you with, your, with the youth to navigate those things. And the last one is share power. I will tell you that's probably the scariest one as a parent and as, because you're thinking about how do I share my power. And because we work in the school systems, it's something that we are trying, we teach, uh, we train some of our teachers in, this, in these five elements as well. And sharing power in a classroom is hard sometimes because you're trying to navigate 25 kids sometimes. And so, but thinking about, um, I was played basketball and so I was a captain and I was also the point guard. And I think about all the leadership opportunities that I gained from that without knowing that I was gaining that. Thinking about a classroom where they lead a project, where they lead a uh, proposal, and obviously within, you know, giving them the confidence to do that. These are important to our kids. It's respect me, include me, uh, collaborate and let me lead. A lot of youth organizations have the power to do all of this as well, um, because they, the influence that they can make within these elements are so important. And the last one is expand possibilities. You know, one of the things that we see our kids um, when you're working in Title I schools and when you're working with kids who don't have, who are under-resourced, first of all, they don't see the expansion of possibilities and sometimes we have to present those possibilities. And we always say we want them to dream, but in order to dream, they've got to be able to see some things. And so we want to expand things that they maybe aren't familiar to them and giving them those opportunities to do that. Um, broaden their horizons. It's in such an important aspect. So the developmental framework is, is within those five elements, but it's also what it means, it's, built, it's the building block of building assets. There are two types of assets that we're really trying to build in our kids. There are the external assets, so all the things that are around them, right? We're trying to build those positive ones, and the internal assets. And I really think the internal assets I wanna read is important. It's the personal skills. It's the commitments. You know those soft skills when you're hiring someone? 
you think about it from a youth development, you're really building those soft skills. It's the values they need to make good choices, take responsibility for their own lives, and be independent and fulfilled. And you can play a part in each of those, whether you're an aunt, a parent, a mom, a father, an uncle, a youth developer, a clinician, a school teacher, every influence, every circle of influence can use these um, developmental relationships. So the principle of asset buildings, I'm only gonna focus on um, two of them. It's asset building and, or, and is an ongoing process. It is not one time, it's commitment to continue to do that. And repetition is important. So it's cumulative, little things add up and the consistency of showing these um, frameworks, uh, the elements of the development relationships really um, mean a difference. And so remember, I'm not just standing here talking about what I think would be good. There's a lot of research behind that. Um, so internal assets that are built, um, the development of relationships is linked to statistically significant higher levels of caring, responsibility, social emotional skills, and decision making skills. So it's shown it has made a difference in building that asset. It's building those up. And what it does also is that it reduces the risky behaviors. And so the more we can develop the assets, the more we can um, reduce some of the risky behaviors that come into it. And the power of assets is also really helps. You see the number of assets as they grow, the more likelihood you'll see success in, in school, maintaining good health, exhibit leadership, all the things that we want from our youth. So as a community, you think about every adult that our kids come around. If every adult was using the framework of developmental relationships and they would see it consistently, and they would see it repetitively, and they would see it over and over again, how that would build our youth into um, the, the person that they want to be, not the person that we think they should be, but they would have the confidence in really going after the things that they want. And what we have found in the research um, is that one out of five youth report having no developmental relationships. So you think about a classroom, so who, that's kind of who we train the most. You think of a classroom of 25, how many kids of that in there are already feeling like I don't have any relationships that are helping me really build? And so that says a lot. And it means that, that if we can fill in the gaps, then we can reduce that number and we can build that number to be stronger and our community um, be stronger in that. So I really just wanted to come and really present it in a way that I think back about the people that influenced my life and the development of relationships, and I will know, know that not that I had a name to it, but I think each of you can find your circles of where you can influence youth and have maybe just some common language that you can take with you to not feel like, um, you know, if, if we've hired a clinician to do some work, it doesn't mean you have to be a clinical expert. It doesn't mean you have to be this. It means that you just have to be someone who's caring, but with intentionality to really build um, the assets of our kids. So strategies is that we can all do this. Think about how you see yourself in this, in this process. So make it possible. Make it simple. Don't make it complicated. Make the most of your available time. When the Find your time, and, um, and that's, a big, that's a big issue right now. Time is very distracted right now. We have so many things that our kids are being distracted by, and we have so many kids, things that our adults are being distracted by. And so we often, often think about the kids, but we also see the adults in that as well. And then the last one is the commit and don't forget. It's about walking away from here, realizing I do have a space in this, not just in my office, or not just in my group, or not just in my classroom, but I can be a part of that every day. And so I know I went through this really quick because developmental relationships really is its own presentation, but if, it, and if you're interested in more learning more, um, this is a picture of one of our family members with their son, but also with our site coordinator. And the more that we build a community around our kids, the stronger that our kids uh, feel. So um, if you're interested in more, we actually offer training around developmental re uh, relationships. We offer training to the community. We offer training to our schools as an agency. Our goal is to have as many adults learn the framework so there's many adults that our kids come into connection with that there are asset builders for our kids. So uh, thank you all for being here and thank you for being a part of this.